about 30 seconds. One, two. Good afternoon. Welcome to the after, uh, early afternoon session, which, uh, and we're going to do everything we can to keep everybody awake. And this is going to be very interesting because it's peacemaking in a changing neighborhood, the Arab awakening, Iran, and regional dynamics. My name is Sylvia Kaplan. I'm on the J Street board. I live in Minneapolis. Minnesota with my husband Sam Kaplan and uh, but but before that a year ago we lived for three and a half years in Morocco where Sam was the United States ambassador President Obama's ambassador to the kingdom of Morocco so so we um, we were part of this neighborhood um, Sam always describes Morocco as the good kid on the block. We, um, we didn't make trouble, mostly. Uh, Morocco was a, was a strong ally and a good friend of the United States, but it was very difficult for the Moroccans because they felt that they knew the neighborhood. If there were problems with what we call the Arab Spring, the Awakening, whatever you want to describe it, they thought that they could be very helpful to us, and they felt very strongly that the uh, State Department, the United States government, wasn't really listening, wasn't looking for advice. And uh, so this is an interesting way to think about it, and I'll be interested what our panelist has to say. The interesting thing about Morocco was there also is a strong Jewish community, not a large Jewish community, about 4,000, but it is the largest Jewish community in the um, Arab world. And um, what you find, uh, and, and they were obviously supporters of Israel, but not in the way that many of the Jewish groups who came to visit in Morocco thought. So it was uh, complex and nuanced and interesting. And uh, the biggest, and with the rest of the uh, United States, even people who weren't so interested in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should know that in the, uh, in the Arab world, uh, mostly what uh, the United States is held accountable for, in addition to Guantanamo, is what they see is a, a prejudice, a very strong support of uh, Israel, who they see as the perpetrator and uh, not supporting Palestinians. So it's interesting to see what a different perspective you get in a different part of the world. At this time, I want to introduce our moderator for this session, and his name is Alan Elsner, and he's J Street's Vice President for Communications. We just visited, and he promised to come and see us in Minnesota, and we're excited about that. Alan, Alan has had a long career at the top ranks of American and international journalism prior to joining J Street, which includes the State Department and later the White House as a correspondent for the Writers News Agency. And um, I think that it's going to be a very interesting program. Thanks so much, uh, Sylvia. I'm sure we'll get to Morocco at some point in this conversation somewhere, maybe. Um, I would like to introduce our uh, distinguished panel. Um, so I'm going to go from, I guess, left to right. Rebecca Abu Shadid is a fellow with the Truman National Security Project and co-chair of its Middle East North Africa Working Group. She's co-chair of the Board of Directors of Just Vision which highlights the power and potential of Palestinians and Israelis working to end the occupation and build a future of dignity, freedom, equality, and human security using nonviolent means. Next to her, we have Professor Abbas Milani, who is the Director of Iranian Studies at Stanford University and a professor in the Division of Stanford Global Studies and a co-director of the Iran Democracy Project at the Hoover Institution. Up till 1986, he taught at Tehran University's Faculty of Law and Political Science. And lastly, we have Ambassador Dan, Daniel Kurtzer, who was the ambassador for the United States to Israel from 2001 to 2005. 
and as the U.S. ambassador to Egypt from 1997 to 2001. He also served as a political officer at the American embassies in Cairo and Tel Aviv, deputy director of the Office of Egyptian Affairs, deputy assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs, and principal deputy assistant secretary of state for intelligence and research. And on a slight personal note, when I was working for Reuters in the 1990s, and Ambassador Kurtzer then was in the peace team, there were two officials who were very frustrating for us journalists. One was Aaron Miller, now known as Aaron David Miller, <laughs> and the other was Dan Kurtzer, and they were frustrating because you couldn't get a single word out of either one of them. And now look what's happened. <laughs> Okay, so we have a very, very wide uh, purview. Um, the subject is, um, is the region as a whole, and obviously you only have to take a look at uh, the region and you see a, a region in total, um, in, in total um, turmoil. Uh, not so much seems to be left of the Arab Spring. To the south of Israel, uh, Egypt seems to have reverted to authoritarian rule. They've just had a, an election in which uh, General Sisi was elected by, I think, 96 or 97 percent of the vote. Um, there are uh, obviously the, the days of uh, Tahrir Square seem to be long ago, and there's been a clampdown on, uh, on free speech and free press. Um, and just to uh, the west of that, I guess we have Libya, which uh, seems to be in the throes perhaps of a, a, a resurgence of, of violence, although we hope not. And then to the northeast, we have Syria, which is now in uh, the third year of an extraordinarily bloody and tragic uh, civil war. And uh, I understand, you know, the casualty toll is somewhere around 160,000. Um, millions of refugees have spilled out of Syria into Jordan, into Turkey, and into Lebanon, with a potential destabilizing effect on those societies. Um, and one uh, understands that, um, that the civil war may be tilting towards Assad a little bit, uh, although that's not very clear. That civil war has also drawn in Hezbollah from Lebanon um, as an active uh, participant. Uh, one worries about what might happen in Jordan because of the influx of the refugees and, uh, uh, and because of the growth of, um, of, of Islamicism uh, there, and Jordan remains a key uh, U.S. Uh, ally. Um, right next to Syria we have Iraq, which uh, I, I understand that the casualty toll of the violence in Iraq approaches seven or eight hundred people a month, although we don't read much about Iraq anymore now that the U.S. has uh, withdrawn its troops. And then we have the big enchilada, which is uh, Iran, and, uh, and, and, and how that all kind of connects is, is, I think, very interesting and a very interesting theme for this panel. So we have the negotiations going on between the P5 plus 1 and Iran on the Iranian nuclear program. There is a July 20th deadline. Um, it seems that both sides uh, have entered the negotiations with a, a strong desire to reach a, a deal, but it's still not clear whether we will have a deal. If we do have a deal, I think we can predict strong opposition to it from Israel and from Israel's allies in the United States, which I think is going to draw J Street into some interesting um, situations. And I think hanging over this whole situation with Iran, we have this Shia Sunni, Sunni divide, um, which is drawing some of the traditional authoritarian Sunni states in the Gulf, like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. One one hears closer to Israel as a counterbalance, but they can't kind of come out and say it until there's a resolution of the Palestinian problem, and there's not going to be a resolution of the Palestinian problem anytime soon. So um, a real kind of very, very complex situation to unpack. So what I'm going to do is, having set the stage, uh, turn it over to each of the panelists to make some opening remarks, and then we'll have some Q&A. And um, I think I would like to start with Ambassador Kurtzer. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, uh, two preliminary remarks. First, uh, now that Aaron Miller and I have started talking, I guess you're saying you can't get us to stop, which <laughs> may, may influence my remarks today. The other is I'll <laughs> defer to Professor Milani, but I've never heard Iran called the big, big enchilada. Before, so <laughs> I haven't either. We've already broken ground. <laughs> the, um, the, the big shashlik. Right. <laughs> 
Look, you've described uh, in broad, broad strokes uh, a, a region that is in uh, a quite serious turmoil and change. But in fact, uh, there are some other uh, long-term changes that we have been watching for 20 years that even preceded what we now know as the Arab Spring or the Arab Revolutions. It's a region in which the Arab state system has been in long-term collapse. Uh, the internal dynamics of most uh, Arab societies, except for the monarchies, which I'll come back to in a moment, uh, have uh, largely degraded over time uh, with a loss of legitimacy, succession crises, corruption, crony capitalism. Uh, in other words, a number of internal weaknesses which have uh, caused a situation that, whereas in the past, you would look to Damascus, Baghdad, and Cairo as the kind of core of what was happening in the region. And now, nobody really pays attention to what's happening in those three capitals, other than the fact that you have this debilitating civil war in Syria. And a corollary of that has been uh, the growing influence of peripheral or periphery states in determining what happens in the region, Turkey, Iran, and Israel. Not Arab states, uh, not intrinsically part of the Arab core, but largely now are determining uh, much of the uh, dynamics in the region. Uh, some of this may be attributable to the uh, breakdown of uh, the, the old consensus about uh, pan-Arab secular nationalism, the kind of Nasser vision of the Middle East, which 20, 25 years ago gave way to what we're now calling the Islamist uh, vision. Uh, a change from Nasser to Nasrallah, as it may be, in, uh, in looking at the region. Um, and of course, you have the internal splits, as you mentioned, the Sunni Shia and other uh, dynamics. So this is a region that has been in long-term flux. Uh, and uh, all of these factors seem to come together uh, uh, or at the right time, or at the, the one time, uh, with the spark uh, by a fruit vendor in Tunisia that uh, seem to galvanize uh, uh, young people in particular, but a lot of different opposition forces to come together. What this means, I think it's too early to tell. I've been watching uh, Egypt most closely, uh, not just because uh, I spent almost seven and a half years of my life uh, working in the American embassy there, but also because uh, to a large extent, uh, as Egypt goes, uh, much of the region will go. And if the Egyptian experiment in uh, growing something other than a Praetorian military-backed rule can take root, then the region does have a chance of success. Tunisia is not going to have that impact, even if Tunisia succeeds. And certainly, if Yemen succeeds, it's not going to have an impact. But if Egypt changes, then it does create a dynamic uh, which is quite different. And the situation in Egypt is, uh, you know, maybe we're in the eighth or ninth round of what will end up being a 15 round heavyweight bout. Uh, traditionally, that heavyweight bout in Egypt involved two sumo type Egyptian forces. You had the military on the one hand, and you had the Muslim Brotherhood on the other hand. And they've been duking it out now for uh, 60 years. What's new is this third force in the ring. And that is something we call the opposition civil society that knows quite well what it doesn't want, but is not quite sure how to formulate an idea of what it does want and can't quite get organized. But they're in the ring, and they showed last July that they're able to bring down an elected government. So you now have a newly elected president, 97% of the vote. He's wondering why he didn't get the other 3%. <laughs> and the question's gonna be whether he goes after that other 3%. But if he is wise, uh, General LCC, now President LCC, is going to have to figure out a way not to alienate those folks who will go out on the streets and make his life difficult. Not impossible, because he does still represent the coercive force within society, but could make his life difficult enough to uh, make it a challenge uh, to govern. One of the questions that implicit in this is, does the peace process make a difference. And of course, this leads to the, the issue in Washington, which has been become part of the partisan divide of whether there is such a thing called linkage or not. Um, those who believe in linkage say that if you solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, 
the rest of the region's problems go away, and that's nonsense. But it's equally nonsense for those who argue that if you solve some of the rest of the region's problems, the Arab-Israeli conflict will go away. We saw Michael Duran, a, a, a member of the George W. Bush administration, former uh, Princeton faculty member, wrote in 2002 that the road, and he said this, the road to Jerusalem runs through Baghdad. In other words, if you can change Iraqi politics and make Iraq a democratic society, no problem on the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's as much nonsense as those who believe the other phenomenon. These are two uh, distinct but interrelated problems. If you can make progress on the Arab-Israeli conflict, you will see an impact on other areas uh, of discourse in this region, particularly from an American policy-making perspective. You remember, Alan, a few years ago, uh, General Petraeus twice said that uh, he has only heard in the region complaints about the failure or the lack of American leadership on the peace process, even when he's discussing issues of deep national security for countries with which he's dealing. Now, he was misunderstood. You know, the, the neoconservatives said, oh, he's one of those uh, uh, linkage people who's only focused on the peace process. No, what he was saying is that as I'm trying to build relationships with Arab leaders that are important to the United States, they want to know why, why we're not also working on the peace process. So I, I think, uh, in a sense, these are all independent but interrelated issues. It's a region um, that lends itself to that kind of mix of issues, and one that keeps most of us in business for 35 years. <laughs> Professor Milani. Well, first of all, I have to say, this is the first time I've heard enchilada uh, <laughs> referred to Iran. Uh, and I think Mexicans might find uh, take an exception to that description. Uh, I'm going to give you cautiously optimistic view of what the future of the Middle East is. And let me begin with Morocco, about which I know very little. Uh, <laughs> but I just read a remarkable book uh, by a Moroccan prince, uh, Prince uh, Ben Abdullah, uh, Jean Ben Abdullah. He's the third in line for the throne. He's at Stanford, that's why I know him. And when we visited Stanford, I don't know whether you remember, you, the ambassador was kind enough. I, I went to Stanford as a faculty with a group of uh, the alumni, and they invited us. And uh, Hisham has written really one of the most remarkable books for any royalty. I just wrote a book about the Shahs. I've been involved in how royalty think about politics. And this is one of the most unabashedly democratic, secular, self-critical, and by self I mean himself and the royal family. He lays very clearly the level of corruption at the Mahzan, at the court, and says the only future for royalty in the Muslim world is if they withdraw from the realm of politics and take a role similar to uh, England. It is truly a remarkable book, both for its frankness and for the richness of its democratic discourse. That leads me to Iran. Uh, I am very cautious optimistic about the future of Iran and about the future of the Middle East. Because I think there are three countries in the last 100 years that have essentially shaped the future of the Middle East. Three bellwether states, Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. Look at these three countries in the last 120 years. Everything that has happened in the rest of the Middle East has virtually begun in one of these three capitals. And in my view, what we are witnessing in all three of these people and places is the defeat of political radical Islam. I think we are nearing a very important historical threshold. Talking about Iran and saying that radical Islam or political Islam has been defeated, it seems ironic, but I stand by that claim. I think radical Islam in Iran has been uh, defeated. The regime still has a lot of bite. It has a lot of money. It has some 5 million of uh, 75 million people that is strongly support it. Uh, I think they're calling from the court in Morocco <laughs> to say, why did you talk about it? Uh, but nevertheless, it is politically, in my view, uh, at a dead end. Uh, the future of Iran because of a disproportionately large number of young people, 
a disproportionately largely assertive feminist movement in Iran. Yes, a women's movement in Iran, as we speak, uh, because of a remarkably internet savvy society, a society that wants to join the global market, uh, market, a society that has 40 million internet users, a society that has 5 million Facebook users, although Facebook is banned in Iran, uh, women who are beginning to fight this regime in the most frontal manner possible. They're putting their own pictures without a veil on the Facebook and going to prison for it. On every front, you see, in my view, a society that is jettisoning the ways of radical Islam and trying to embrace a new way forward. A new way forward that is democratic, that is secular, and it is Islamic. It is Islamic because the majority of Iranians are Muslims. Uh, it is not Islamic inspired. It doesn't want to force Sharia on people. And that is, in my view, where the bulk of the Iranian society stands today. And in a sense, the government of Rouhani, the newly elected president, is a reflection of this shift in Iranian society. He's not creating that shift, but it is a reflection of that shift. If we have time, I can describe the remarkable thing that happened in this election. In this election, people decided to use Rouhani against a status quo they thought was dead, and to use Rouhani for an improvement in the lives of the people that had reached desperate level. Uh, the sanctions were hurting, the economic isolation was hurting, the political isolation was hurting, is it still hurting the Iranian society? As I said, has wonderful sides to it, but it also has some remarkably tragic consequences as a result of these bad policies of the last 30 years. Iran has one of the highest, if not the highest, percentage per capita of opium and heroin and uh, uh, methamphetamine addiction. It is estimated that 7 million people are addicted. That's almost 10% of the entire population. There is corruption. There is all of these things. But there is a desire to join the 21st century. There is a desire to say that our enemies are the internal corruption. Our enemies are the, the rent system that has completely destroyed one of the greatest windfalls in Iranian history. In Ahmadinejad, eight years presidency. We all hear about Ahmadinejad because of his odious comments on the Holocaust. But Ahmadinejad has squandered $700 billion worth of uh, oil revenues that have come. And the government itself, the Rouhani government itself, says this is the most corrupt eight years of the contemporary history of Iran. A hundred billion is completely missing from public coffers. 87 billion of it has gone to Turkey in money laundering operations. Virtually the entire financial corruption uh, fiasco of the Erdogan government is inspired by Iran. The person that uh, was handling it, the person that bribed the Turkish uh, uh, sons of the ministers and the minister were all the monies that were coming from Iran. It was estimated that 87 billion dollars was laundered to Turkey alone. So you have a desire, in my view, of people to change. And you have a recognition by many, even within the leadership. Uh, the leadership is very much split. The leadership of the Islamic Republic is very much split. The only thing they are now uh, united on is that they want to have an end to the sanctions. And for that, they know they need to make some concessions. But they're not united on how many concessions they need to make. Just this morning, 43 members of the Iranian parliament, this is about one-seventh of the entire membership, has written a letter criticizing Rouhani for jeopardizing Iranian national security, for negotiating on the nuclear issue, for negotiating with the United States directly, for having ambiguous positions on Israel. These are the three specific instances where they've been criticized for. So, in my view, there is going to be a deal because I think the majority of the Iranian leadership has decided that they need to make a deal. Uh, I think the outlines of the deal are already in place. Iran is going to continue some level of enrichment uh, at 5%. Uh, at 
they're going to reduce substantially their 20% enriched uranium uh, that is of concern everywhere else. They're going to allow uh, intrusive interna uh, international sanctions. I think they're going to redesign the Iraq heavy water reactor because it is the place that they're most, uh, they know the international community is most concerned about. In other words, they're trying to find a deal. Uh, I think Rouhani and his team is trying to find a deal that will pass muster with Khamenei so that Khamenei can sell it to his lunatic base as saying that we didn't give up everything. Although I think historically he will go down in history as a person who has made some of the grossest miscalculations about how to get a nuclear program. If Iran truly wanted to get a peaceful nuclear program, they have paid the heaviest price of anyone, anywhere, and they still don't have a nuclear uh, program. So because of these developments and because of the weight that Iran has and because of the uh, internal divisions within the, reg the regime, uh, I think the role of the regime and of Iran in the future is going to be much less belligerent. L let me end by reminding you of one very interesting fact. After the uh, alleged elections in Syria, when Mr. Assad was allegedly re-elected, it took four days for Rouhani to send him a congratulation. After the third day, the conservatives began attacking him. Why aren't you sending a telegram? After four days, he has sent a rather terse uh, telegram saying that we hope the future will enable the wish of the Syrian people to be materialized. That is a far cry from the radical revolutionary guards who said, we have several thousand missiles in Syria, we have 4,000 IRGC commanders in Syria, and if Israel moves, we will use those to attack anywhere in Israel. That tone is very different from what it was before, and I think that is the beginning of a very important shift that promises uh, hopeful things for the future. Thank you. I'm actually, um, yeah, please. <laughs> My heart is warmed by the idea that there is somewhere that you can still send a telegram. <laughs> And I also have inspiring um, visions of the Moroccan Pippa Middleton. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Re Rebecca uh, Abu Shadi. Thank you. Um, first, I just really want to thank you all for, for inviting me. I, I was also the uh, political director at the Arab American Institute for five years before there was a J Street. And so, I want you all to know what a difference you have made in such a short amount of time in terms of how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is discussed in Washington. The work that you're doing, I know it must feel like we're all working uphill, but you really have made an enormous amount of difference in a short amount of time. So please uh, don't give up, no matter what. Um, I, I think, I, I'm gonna try to be as optimistic as possible. But I think that there are real challenges in the region. The first thing is that we are in an era of, of constant change, and it's so hard to react in a smart and thoughtful way uh, on a daily basis when things are changing at such a rapid pace. And, and that, I think, has been a real challenge for the Obama administration. And so what I'm going to try to do is kind of give you some of the the things that I hear when I go back to the region. Um, I spent my life in between Lebanon and, and here, and I spent a lot of time in Egypt, and, and I just kind of want to let you know when we talk as Americans what sometimes is heard, because um, I think it could be instructive. Um, the first thing that I hear often is that as Americans, we're very good at talking and not great at listening. And I think that that can be really true. And so I think that as an example in Egypt, um, recently, the, the Egyptian foreign minister, Nabil Fahmi, who spent many years as the ambassador to Washington, and Amr Musa came to Washington, and I know from, from some of their aides, there was a lot of frustration because what they wanted to talk about was uh, economic assistance, and they wanted to talk about their real fears about the spiraling economic situation in Egypt and about unemployment and what they see as these major priorities. 
And what they kept getting asked about was the trials of the, the Muslim Brotherhood. So that is not in any way to say that, that we shouldn't be raising those issues. But it is to say that if you want people to listen to you, you should al also hear them. And so I think we can get better at that. Because I think that if you look at Egypt right now, the people in charge know what an enormous challenge they have before them. And I think that there is a lot of uh, concern and fear about how they're going to, quite frankly, build an Egyptian middle class. There are 80 million Egyptians. That is a third of the population of the Arab world, and they're living in poverty. And so I think that all of the issues that, that we raise for them are always going to be important. Democracy and human rights can never take a back seat, especially after the revolutions that we've seen. But we also need to, to listen, and I think we can do a better job of that. Um, the second is, is, is Syria, and Syria has posed real challenges in terms of what I think is, is the clarity of, of what our goals are, of what our policy is. So I'm going to um, read to you what is the speech I would have written for President Obama had he actually uh, gone through in last September with his threats um, of a military strike in Syria. In fact, much of the debate in Washington has put forward a false choice when it comes to Syria. On the one hand, some question why America should intervene at all, even in limited ways, in this distant land. They argue that there are many places in the world where innocent civilians face brutal violence at the hands of their government. And America should not be expected to police the world, particularly when we have so many pressing needs here at home. It's true that America cannot use our military wherever repression occurs. And given the cost and risks of intervention, we must always measure our interests against the need for action. But that cannot be an argument for never acting on behalf of what's right. In this particular country, at this particular moment, we were faced with the prospect of violence on a horrific scale. We had a unique ability to stop that violence, an international mandate for action, a broad coalition prepared to join us, the support of Arab countries, and a plea for help from the Syrian people themselves. We also had the ability to stop Assad's forces in their tracks without putting American troops on the ground. To brush aside America's responsibility as a leader, and more profoundly, our responsibilities to our fellow human beings under such circumstances would have been a betrayal of who we are. Some nations may be able to turn a blind eye to atrocities in other countries. The United States of America is different. And as president, I refuse to wait for the images of slaughter and mass graves before taking action. That is the speech that the president gave. Exactly one week after the, the nonviolent protests started in Syria. But replace everywhere that I said Syria with Libya. That was the president's rationale to the American people for military intervention in Libya. Now, we hear it as Americans, and it's a message from our president convincing us why he felt he had to take that action. But in Syria, they also heard it. And so, I was at, a, at an event with an amazing Syrian uh, activist named Orwa Naidabia, and he's also a producer and a filmmaker of a really fantastic film called Return to Homs. And it's going to be, it won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance and will be released in the United States in the coming weeks. And he was asked, after, what, after screening his film, what did you think was going to happen? You were fighting an army with tanks, and you had nothing. Did you think that they were just going to go peacefully into the night? And he said, no. We talked about that. We knew that people would die. But we also thought that you would help us. And we thought that because your president said that he would. And so I think that while these questions are very difficult, and America sees and feels a changing role for itself in terms of leadership, we have to always remember that when the president of the United States speaks, it's not only Americans who hear it. So not to be such a downer, but I also think there are opportunities. And the opportunity is that when people still speak about what they want in the Arab world, it's still very modeled, very much modeled after what we have here. They still say that what they want is a democracy. 
They still say that what they want is jobs and to build a middle class. And when they think about a middle class, they're not thinking of the Chinese middle class or the Russian middle class. They're thinking about the American middle class. When people were out in Tahrir Square, they cared what President Obama had to say about their revolution, and they were very proud. And so when America speaks, it's, it's a good thing that they're still listening. And Finally, I want to talk about the fact that one in five uh, people in the Arab world are between the ages of 15 and 24. More than half are below the age of 25. Each year, 500,000 people enter the, the workforce, and 90% of them are youth. And so that is an opportunity to really change what this region looks like going forward. And it's a, it's a chance to really engage people in a, in a productive way. And I think that the most important thing is, if every time we kind of talk about Egypt, the debate is, do we cut off military aid? And if that's the only thing that we can think of in terms of our, the relationship between the United States and Egypt, that leads me to think that what we've done is very narrowly focus what the United States' role is in that region. We're not just a bunch of arms dealers, right? And so the opportunity there, and I would point you to an excellent article by Ambassador Kurtzer in the National Interest, is to really reorient much of what our aid does right now. So reorient that economic aid for job creation programs, for education programs, to help bring Egyptians to the United States to study. That really does make a huge difference, and it will answer so many of the, the very serious and pressing concerns in the region, and the United States will be seen to be fulfilling the promises that we make to the region. Uh, when President Obama gave his speech to Cairo, uh, in Cairo in 2009, very much like when he went to Jerusalem, this president understands the power of words and he understands the power of who he is as a historic figure. And just like in Israel when he talked over the heads of Israeli leaders directly to the people in the audience, directly to the youth in Israel, he was trying to do very much that in Cairo. And what he was saying to those people, and the reason that speech was so well received, was he was saying, for all of these decades, you've been allowed to feel that the United States relationship is with your leader, is with your dictator, is with your military. Well, no more. I see you. I, as the President of the United States, see you, and I understand what you want, and it matters. And going forward, the relationship between the United States will not just be with your leaders, but will also be with you. And so that's the opportunity. The opportunity is for us to really think in very new ways, which I think we haven't done yet after in, in a post-2011 Arab Revolution world, to really think about different and exciting ways that we can build, rebuild some of our relationships with the people in the region. Thank you. I want to build on those remarks and, and address a question to Ambassador Kurtzer, but in a slightly different way. Um, and the question is, has U.S. influence and um, credibility been badly damaged in the last six plus years by the fact that um, some of the Arab states looked at the way Obama abandoned Mubarak that's the charge, whether one accepts it or not. By the fact that he threatened, he drew a, a red line in Syria and then failed to deliver. Um, what has been the effect of... of, of and, 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 and also, I think, the sense that, uh, that, that, the, that the U.S. is tired of, of involvement in this area, that Iran and Afghanistan has, has basically made our people weary of war, and that when President Obama did not follow through in Syria, that was bowing to the will of the American people, in a sense. So, um, um, in, in, in pure power, real politique terms, is the U.S. seen as a weaker ally, as an unreliable ally? And has that had some effect, perhaps, on the failure of the Kerry effort between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Look, there's no question, from an objective standpoint, the United States is not a weak country, and nor are we a weakened country, but we are perceived uh, widely now in the Middle East as a reluctant uh, power, reluctant to intervene, reluctant to uh, stand for the things that we say we stand for, and reluctant to carry through on uh, the rhetoric that the President does use so uh, very often so elegantly. 
Uh, and there's, there's a problem here. It's a problem that doesn't trace its origins just to the past five and a half years, but since uh, the beginning of our interventions in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan might have been understood had it been a, uh, a one-off uh, response to 9-11, but uh, Iraq is not understood anywhere in this region, and uh, that has left a residual effect both in the region and in the willingness of the American people to embark on what's going to be another adventure. Uh, whether or not uh, the president was right or wrong to uh, not intervene in Syria, in the back of his mind was maybe the title of Jim Baker's book, The Politics of Diplomacy. Uh, there are politics involved here as well as the diplomatic requirements, and uh, Syria just looked like a situation to the president that uh, was going to uh, repeat the kind of long-term American involvement on the ground. Now, I know people don't necessarily admit that that was going to be the case, but on the ground that the president did not want to uh, engage in. And so you have this disconnect between uh, the power of the United States and the perception of its power, which relates to the willingness to use military force after more than a decade of only using military force uh, in this region. What the president tried to describe at West Point, and even before that, when he spoke uh, right after the uh, Crimea uh, crisis began, was I think he's trying to articulate uh, what might be called the ultimate Obama doctrine, which has much more to do with the value of not just diplomacy, but of multilateralizing diplomacy, sharing the burden for uh, international crises, uh, that uh, are beyond the, the uh, purview only of the United States to resolve. Syria in this case is going to be an interesting study because it was never only in the hands of the United States to deal with the Syrian crisis. There was no consensus in the Arab world. In fact, Syria has been called a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, between Qatar and other countries. Uh, there was never a consensus within the UN Security Council, Russia and China, continuously uh, blocked any efforts from the beginning, including till today, to do more than the kind of uh, relatively weak intervention that we've done. And so you have a president who's trying to multilateralize diplomacy and finding that even that is not getting the traction that he would like to see it. So there is a, a sense of uh, a policy that's adrift. He's trying to sheer the, steer this ship to shore but it's, uh, it's not yet succeeded. And to go back to your question, the answer is yes. We are perceived as a weaker country because we have not articulated a, uh, a sense of a policy that has legs, that can actually carry itself forward in this uh, very difficult environment. Mm. Professor Milani, you made a, a very provocative and, and, and uh, what I found an interesting statement in your opening remark, I'm gonna quote you, we are witnessing the defeat of radical political Islam. Um, could I you know, put a, a counter um, argument, and that is that the Iranian regime has pursued the idea of getting nuclear weapons very persistently and with great determination for uh, at least two decades. Um, and they have known when to when to step on the accelerator, and they have known when to stop, step on the brake. And there, there was a period, I think, after the 2003 is, um, um, U.S. invasion of Iraq where they stepped on the brake because they were afraid that they might be the next. Uh, and one could argue that this is another time when they're stepping on the brake, but what is the evidence that they have given up the goal of becoming a nuclear-armed power and a hegemonic power in the region? Uh, I never made the claim that they have given up the uh, hope or the aspiration to become the hegemonic power in the region. Uh, I don't think there is uh, uh, any doubt in my mind, at least, that they have been and continue to be pursuing at least a breakout capacity, if not uh, outright bomb. A breakout capacity is the capacity to actually build the bomb. You have you put all the pieces in place and just don't make the bomb because you don't want to pay the political price that will come with uh, making that last step. 
to me, it's very clear that they have been trying to uh, reach that, and they're very close to it. And they are, in fact, continuing with their uh, ballistic missile program. They are continuing to test it. And what in, uh, the letter that I referred to, where the members of the parliament are attacking Rouhani, one of the things they're criticizing him for is that Rouhani actually tried to put a stop to some of the most recent ballistic missile tests because he thought they would be provocative. So I think you're absolutely right. There is, I have seen no evidence that the regime has given up its effort to reach the breakout capacity. In fact, if you read Rouhani's uh, memoirs, uh, I, I've written several articles on Rouhani and his nuclear strategy. Uh, they're all, all of them are in the New Republic. And then I also wrote an article with Sick Hacker, really a remarkable nuclear scientist. That's in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists where we offer a different way of uh, Iran's nuclear program could have gone. Uh, and incidentally, I have to say that uh, the pursuit of a breakout capacity precedes this regime. The Shah was actually going for the same thing when the Shah uh, began its nuclear program. And ironically, Israel was one of the biggest supporters of Iran's nuclear program. And Israel was cooperating with Iran, giving Iran certain technologies that they were trying to hide from the United States. There's some evidence that they were giving uh, Iran certain aspects of a nuclear program. Uh, and the United States was very much worried, again, contrary to what this regime says. The Carter administration and the Ford administration, the minute they realized the Shah was going for a breakout capacity, they put on the uh, stops and they stopped American companies from bidding with, on Iran's nuclear program. That's a very interesting, complicated history. So, what I suggested wasn't that Iran is going to be necessarily a lesser power. What I am suggesting is that if you read 10 years ago, if you read Khamenei's speeches 10 years ago, he was literally making the argument, and I'm again paraphrasing, but not uh, in spirit, uh, diverting from his comment. He said, capitalism, the West, Israel, the entire democratic uh, globe we understand, the democratic Western world, is on a decline. We are near a historic turn. He kept talking about a historic turn. And that historic turn, he said, will give us the rise of a new civilization based on Islam. They're not talking about a new historical turn anymore. They have seen their fortune fall in uh, Egypt. They have seen Tunisia. They have seen the crisis in Turkey. They have seen the crisis Mr. Erdogan has created by pushing a little bit on the Islamist path. And everywhere, I mean, Tunisia is not a model, but I think Tunisia is, in fact, a harbinger. Radical Islamists failed. They failed in Egypt. They failed in Tunisia. They failed in Iran. And now they're trying to keep a face-saving uh, mechanism. And I think the Iranian people are trying to do something very difficult and very complicated. They're trying to really change this regime without having a regime change. Because they have seen what this regime, the most radical elements of this regime will do if they're frontally assaulted. What this regime did in Syria, and have, I don't think anybody has any doubt that what kept Syria afloat was more than anything else the money close to $7 billion admitted in the last seven, eight months. And the sending of Hezbollah and the sending of the IRGC forces to keep Assad uh, afloat. Uh, but in spite of that tactical victory, everywhere else you see uh, radical Islamists as a model. The model in Iran was Khomeini. The model in Egypt was the Muslim Brotherhood. The model in Tunisia was Muslim Brotherhood Light. Uh, all of these have not been able to solve the problems of this region. And the youth that she referred to, that is a reality in Iran, are not buying it. They're not buying the story that the way out of the misery that has been the Middle East for the last 100 years is to go back to the ways of the Prophet 1,300 years ago. The way to the future is the future, not the past. And to me, that is a paradigmatic shift of incredible importance in Iran, and I think in the rest of the region. Um, I'm going to ask one uh, question of, uh, of Rebecca here, and then we're going to open it to some questions. 
from the floor. So you painted a, a, um, a dramatic picture of a um, population surge of, of young people who are frustrated, who are un unemployed, oftentimes go through college, get an education, but there's really nothing for them to do. And, and, and my question to you is, um, we've seen um, the specter in, um, in other parts of the world, in Africa, and, and to some extent, I think, in Yemen, of failed states. And we saw it in Afghanistan. We've seen it in Somalia. Um, and now we have um, Syria, which is being ripped apart by this awful war. And we have this uh, situation in Egypt where it's very hard to envisage, even with all the will in the world, with all the investment that the West can put there, which doesn't seem to be very much. Um, so my question is, how real is there a danger of a, a failed state emerging in, in the region? And, and what would the implications of that be? I mean, it seems to me that the danger in Syria is, is imminent. Uh, Syria is a, a country of 20 million people, and 9.5 million of them are in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. Lebanon is a country of four and a half million people, and there are numbers of up to two million Syrian refugees in the country. Uh, when you talk about young men and women who are graduating from college and can't find jobs, I'm related to many of them. <laughs> and so I think it... So am I. <laughs> I. I think it's, I mean, it is a... You know, I mean, when we look at Syria, so many of the things that we were worried about, that we said we were worried about happening if we intervened, happened even though we didn't intervene. In the sense of, you know, Assad has lost control of, of large parts of the country in the north and the east, and there was a vacuum, and that vacuum got filled. And it got filled by groups that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And so I think the idea that it's true that even billions of dollars right now, I mean, the $12 billion that the Gulf has put in Egypt has barely kept, kept it afloat. Um, but we still have to keep, we have to keep trying. We have to figure out what to do with um, these, you know, with these young people in the region. And we, we have to, because we see what happens if we, if, if we don't. We see what happens if we disengage. And, and so that's really um, my hope, is that, that all of us kind of, when we leave here, um, that I know, I know that for a group like J Street, specifically the Israeli-Palestinian issue is of great concern. But I also think that the future of the region, we have such an ability to positively affect the future of the region. And um, you know, as you're speaking to your members of Congress and your friends and, and the members of your congregation, I hope that um, thinking through creative ways that we can do that remains high on the agenda. Thank you. Now, uh, we've got microphones on either side, and if you have a question, just um, please stand by one of the mics, and, and, and uh, let's have questions and not speeches, if, that, if that's okay. Sir. I'd like to thank, like to thank all the panelists for really provocative remarks. One check. Yeah. Hi. I'd like to thank all the panelists for really provocative and interesting remarks. I'm Alan Weiner. I teach at Stanford Law School. Question for my colleague uh, Abbas Malani. I also want to push back a little bit on the claim about the demise of radical political Islam. I think that claim is actually a plausible one, but you also seem to imply that what would come in its place was democracy. And when I look at the examples that you cite, um, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Turkey, and uh, Iran, what I see instead is authoritarian, you know, the Mahabharat states coming to power. And then for the whole panel, um, Israel has used the tumult in the region as sort of an excuse with respect to the two-state solution to sort of step back and say, well, things are very uncertain. Maybe we should just hunker down. And I'm wondering uh, about your thoughts as to whether that's the right strategy. Thank you. Who wants to take this? Uh, well, he asked uh, about uh, the demise of radical Islam. Uh, what I said about the demise of radical Islam was, in my view, uh, what is truly in paradigmatic shift. But as paradigms shift always, you know that there are multiple alternatives that can take its place. Democracy is one of them. Uh, and m my sense is that in the future of the region, because of all the demographics, if Iran is any indication, if Turkey is any indication, what you're going to get 
is, uh, if two out of three go on a democratic path, I think that the region will go that way as well. But part of the problem that uh, I think we have to recognize is that if you look at the process of democratization in, uh, for example, England, it took about 400 years. It took from the time of Elizabeth to the time of 20th, 19th century. You had a lot of upheavals. In the region, they're trying to do this under a, a rather compressed time, and under 100 years. In Iran, it's been 100 years. The effort has been 100 years. So to me, uh, what promise, uh, I can only speak about Iran. Uh, I, I really can't speak in any serious manner about other countries. But in Iran, I think what is on the horizon is not a Mukhabarat state, but I think is on the horizon is a, a state that is responsive to the people, that is law-abiding, that recognizes the right of privacy, that, is re that recognizes the right of a woman to uh, equal uh, rights, the uh, rights of a woman to equal value of life. 60% uh, of Iran's graduates in science and engineering today are women. You're, they're not going to be able to, you're not going to hold this society <laughs> back. I mean, it, it is just, and uh, have no, uh, I have no illusion. This regime tried to do with Iranian women in 1979, essentially what Taliban tried. This says, go home. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini famously said the most sacred uh, place for women is in the uh, kitchen. The role is the mother. They gave women enormous opportunities to stop imp being employed. Women decided not to do it. And now they are in different uh, domains. That's what gives me uh, optimism. I wish you could read some of the, uh, the art articles that are coming out of Iran, inside Iran, as we speak about the rule of law, about the laws of privacy. For the first time, and I'll finish here, for the first time in 140 years, the rights of a religious minority called the Baha'is in Iran are being recognized. More and more intellectuals are saying, why have you done this to these people? Some clerics are saying, you should recognize the right of citizenship. The regime is denying them the right to go to university. It's even shutting down their uh, uh, private universities when they have built it. And now you have a remarkable number of intellectuals for the first time in 140 years who are saying, shame on us for not, in, not having stood up for the rights of this minority, and we must now say enough is enough, give them the right they deserve. Let me reformulate Professor Wiener's quest, second part of the question to you, Ambassador Kurtzer, and, and it's not that Israel has used the tumult in the region as an excuse, but that Netanyahu clearly talks about Iran, and I, and I don't think that he, he's using it as an excuse. It seems to come from, from deep within him. Um, when, he, when he makes a speech, it's 90% Iran, and it's 8% domestic, and 1% peace process, if that. So, uh, you know, how, how is he viewing uh, these developments, and is there still a, an Israeli military option, in your opinion? Look, I think uh, often we tend to demonize the Prime Minister and, and suggest that everything he says comes out of some ideological fountain of opposition to Palestinian nationalism. The reality is that Israel has very significant strategic and security concerns. Uh, given the eight years of Ahmadinejad's comments, not just about the Holocaust, but about Zionism and, and the Zionist entity, um, Israel needs to take notice and can't simply dismiss this as rhetoric. Uh, there's been a debate in Israel now for more than 30 years since the 1973 war about the fallacy of building a strategic doctrine only on the basis of intentions rather than on the basis of capabilities. So you do have a concern that's legitimate. Similarly, with the situation surrounding Israel, it's legitimate for Israel to debate the question of whether or not uh, the <coughs> um, uh, situation in surrounding countries, particularly its major treaty partner, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, and Lebanon to the north, and the degree to which Hezbollah has uh, amplified its military capabilities as a result of its intervention in Syria, would warrant an Israeli response of hunkering down. It is not an illegitimate way to think about this. 
The alternative, however, is to uh, take a look at the situation and say, when our enemies are weakened, which they are at the moment, when we know that Hamas and Fatah are weakened, which we know at the moment, might this not be an opportunity to actually take the risks associated with peacemaking and to try to concretize a different relationship within the house, as it were, between the river and the sea, so that we can present a better front for the rest of the Arab world. And I think that's the debate, but I, I think it would be wrong for all of us to think that this is a binary choice, that if Israel somehow says our concerns about security are so deep that we, uh, uh, we are nervous, that somehow that's wrong. I think you know, the paranoiacs having enemies uh, sometimes applies here. There are serious strategic and security issues that the government and the people of Israel face. Uh, I think our view in this conference has been that there are also risks that can be taken and mitigated at this time, which will actually be better for Israel in the long term than simply hunkering down. Let's take a question, question over there. Yes. Yes. Um, Ambassador Kurtzer uh, mentioned, you know, the approach of the United States, uh, of the, you know, President Obama, to take a multilateral approach to problems in the Middle East, which I personally welcome as opposed to the Rambo gumboat approach that we've taken in the past. Having said that, I want to ask you, Rebecca, what is the reasonable expectation of the Arab League to be involved in solutions in the Middle East? I noticed Muslims have an incredible capacity to slaughter each other for, in sectarian grounds. And is there, and the United States in many cases expected to come in and intervene in those civil wars, but what can we reasonably expect from the Arab League to come in and to be a part of the solution? So I think human beings have a remarkable capacity to slaughter each other. Um, and I also think, um, you know, there, there were critics of President Obama's initial response to the uprisings in Egypt saying that he wasn't fast enough and he, we weren't on the right side of history and we should have, you know, gotten on the side of the protesters a day before, two days before, and similarly when the Green Movement started in Iran, it was, there was a question of why isn't he jumping in and why isn't... I think that there was a wisdom in the President saying Ownership of these changes needs to be made by the people in these countries and the people in the region. I think that was correct. And I think that it's a fine line, but I think people appreciated the fact that the United States didn't try to kind of come in and own what they saw as their revolutions. The Arab League is not an impressive institution but it's also, it's a body of its members. And so the fundamental reason we saw uprisings throughout the region is because the relationship between citizen and state was and remains broken. And so unfortunately, if we're looking, I mean, there are times where the Arab League will say, I mean, the Arab League was supportive of the military strikes in Libya and the Arab League took away Syria's seat in, in, the, in the body. And, but do I think that that's going to be the, the kind of beacon for where we're going to see change in the region? No. I, I wish that they had their act together a little bit more, but I think that they are by and large a reflection of the governments that make up the countries of the Arab League. Where I think that there's more hope and more kind of more interesting conversations going on is within civil society in those places and we have to be very careful because when we look at change and we talk about democracy we have we have really fetishized elections we have there's a danger of equating democracy with elections and i can understand it because you can see it you see the lines of people and there's a purple finger and you have numbers and you know a leader a new leader emerges and but what democracy i mean none of us would say that our democracy is just our election our democracy is all of it, right? It's the free press and it's the civil society institution and it's you and, and it's all of, and it's a f independent judiciary. And so in Egypt, as an example, when the National Democratic Institute and IRI and, and these, civil, these American groups that help support democratic groups in Egypt, when 
those offices were raided and those people were arrested, our response was to quickly get our people out of the country and one American stayed for trial with all of his Egyptian colleagues. That one American, Robert Becker, did more to represent American values than anything else. We just didn't, exp like, we, the, we were vilified by, and I'll remind you, it was the military that did this, and it was the military governing Egypt at the time. They vilified these people and said that these are foreign agents, and they're paying off people, and this is the United States involving itself in Egyptian affairs, and we never offered a counter narrative. And just imagine the, the message that sent to Egyptian civil society activists about whether we had their back or not. And so that's really, I mean, I'm not the kind of person that, I, I've never served in government, and I, I probably, no one would ever want me to, but the people that I spend time with are those civil society activists. Like Those are the people whose voice I think we need to hear more of. Alan, if I could comment on the Arab League part of the question. Yeah. I, I don't want to absolve the very uh, weak Arab League of Responsibility. I agree. Uh, because there is agency in this world. And in the lifetime of most of us in this room, we saw the Arab League take a decision in 1990 with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait when the League actually took a vote and split and ended up joining, part of the Arab League ended up joining an international coalition to push back the Iraqi aggression. Uh, so I think it's quite serious for uh, the Arab League to take seriously its responsibility when a crisis like uh, Syria erupts. Because if they don't take that responsibility, then it, it does let other countries off the hook. And you can have a, a Russia and a China uh, vetoing Security Council resolutions and basing it on the fact that the Arab League hasn't made a decision. So I think that a lot more uh, attention has to be paid uh, to inter-Arab decision making even in a weak institutional structure. I am afraid that we are out of time. I know there are a couple of people at the mics, but um, you know it's time for Cinderella to leave the ball. Um, <laughs> so uh, I want to thank our panelists for a great discussion. And I wish I had a gavel because this is the end of the uh, J Street um, Summit. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you.